introduction. Can you guys hear me? All right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, for you guys who were here yesterday, apparently uh, I missed the session I was supposed to present yesterday on another topic. So if you were here, I had a small emergency I had to take care of with my son. I'm actually from the DC area, so my son is local, so I have to kind of run up to the school real quick. I apologize. My apologies for that. So if you guys are looking, if you look at yesterday's schedule and you are still interested in that, I may just record myself during that presentation and just send it out, or if you guys are interested in doing like a live version of that, or just, you know. Open spaces today. Open spaces, okay. Uh, I gotta go put some uh, money in the meter. Because uh, I did park on E Street, and I should have metroed in, so uh, my apologies for that too. All right, let's get started. I only got 30 minutes, and the, the, the timer's on. So uh, just for a uh, show of hands, uh, who's deploying to Kubernetes today? Awesome. All right, all right. Um, let's see. Uh, more than five clusters. Raise your hand for those. OK. More than fit, uh, 50 clusters? Nothing crazy? No? OK. All right, another, another quick survey. Uh, because I, I've been doing IT now for 20 plus years. I've been in the government space. I've done a little bit of everything. Just show of hands, who's, who's dealing with either in a federal agency right now or a federal contractor that serves the federal government? Awesome. I'll try to keep the uh, alphabet soup to uh, a minimum. All right, Armo is a small company that's based in Israel. We're, we're, our use case is not federal, so if you came here for that, uh, I apologize. Um, but it, we do have an option, uh, so our, our product does is offered in a self hosted option. So we'll talk about that if we have time at the end. So these are some basic statements to get the conversation started. One of the first things I love to do, and I talk to customers all the time from you know, small one or two developers that are trying to compete you know, in, in the new startup space to large organizations, commercial, banks in Europe, Australia. I've, I've talked to a lot of customers around the world about Kubernetes. And one of the first things I say to kind of break the ice is, Kubernetes by default is not secure. Anybody agree with that or disagree with that statement? Agree, right? Okay, you agree? Okay, awesome. Everybody else disagree then? Or you just don't know? Okay, all right, so these are some stats and there's gonna be a lot of uh, factoids in here but I'm just gonna point out that 96% of organizations are evaluating Kubernetes today. So if you're a contractor, if you're in that space or you're a developer, you're a freelancer, that I know when I did this talk in I did a similar talk in Austin, DevOps days. There was a lot of uh, contractors and developers trying to get their projects off the ground and working at organizations. So think about this, you know, from, from a use case point of view, this is a great space to be in, right? If you're a developer and you're developing for Kubernetes, great space. If you're an ops person and you want to learn a new platform to uh, manage and maintain, this is a great space to be in as well. Because again, the percentages just keep getting better, the numbers are just getting up uh, and better with the, uh, with the increase in popularity of Kubernetes. And it depends on where you go too, because when I asked that question in, in Austin, actually the, the, the audience had more developers that haven't been deploying to Kubernetes just yet. Right? There was a lot of serverless hands going up in the air. How, how many people are deploying to serverless today? Right, okay, all right, awesome. Um, and in the middle here, Kubernetes, because of the increase in popularity, there's gonna be more of a, a, a spotlight on that technology as far as a, a place to attack. So you can see here some screenshots of some news articles um, of recent attacks that have been discovered by various different Intel research groups. So you can see my, the one I love, popular one that I like to scare uh, customers with is the crypto jacking one, right? Because you know, when you talk to small organizations, um, you know, and they see the AWS bill, right? They go, oh wait, what, what happened over the weekend, right? Well, we found out we had a crypto miner spinning itself up and multiplying itself across our cluster and because we didn't lock it down, we have now a $10,000 bill when it should have, our normal bill should have been, I don't know, maybe 100 bucks, right? Um, now, what is the current solution today for security on Kubernetes? Anybody can throw out some ideas, thoughts? What do you guys do today to secure your cluster? Don't be shy. There's gonna be like a little bit of a stand up here as I go through, so. Anybody? I'm sorry? Okay, close down the APIs. Anybody else? Scan it. Scan it with what? Okay, cubes, like some kind of tool? Okay, all right, awesome, awesome. Or do we just leave it to the security people? No, okay. 
So the current security solution do, uh, is failing because again, part of DevOps is the culture, right? It's the process, the people, the technology. What do we use uh, for the technology? We'll talk about that. Of course, I'm here representing Armo and a project called Cubescape. We'll talk about that in a second. So you guys are not familiar. Who's familiar with Project Cubescape? Awesome. All right. All right. Hopefully by the end of this conversation, you'll know a lot about it. Um, and you'll know about a lot of the findings that uh, we discovered over the, the last couple of years of being in existence. Um, the problem with DevOps is that security is not in that culture or that language. So there's that term DevSecOps. You know, we learned earlier about ML ops, right? In there also should be security as well, right? Not to point out that guy's presentation, but security is often left last, right? And, well, and everybody's heard the term shift left, right? Um, so we want to try to do a shift left as much as possible with our security and actually any other piece of our DevOps process. But since I'm here representing security, we'll talk about security. So in order to um, understand how to secure something, and I've been doing security for some time, and I didn't really go back into my background. Actually, I'm a little bit of a jack of all trades. I've done mostly ops side stuff. In the last five years, I've been focused on security when I pivoted to Splunk and then um, after Splunk, I worked a few years at Palo Alto supporting their CNAP product. So Armo came out and said, hey, we need to do something a little different with Kubernetes security. And that's how I ended up at Armo about eight months ago. So I came on board when a lot of this data was being put together and presented back out to the community. Okay? Um, so if it's anything wrong here, don't blame me. Uh, I have someone's name back in Israel. All right, so uh, Kubernetes security, who, why, and how? Why are we using Kubernetes, right? So you can see here some of the reasons. These are common. If you re read any Kubernetes book out there, you've watched a YouTube video about, hey, should I be deploying to Kubernetes? Why you Kubernetes? These are, you, you're gonna see that these are the most common reasons why most organizations choose Kubernetes. No brainer there. Now, what's interesting is the fluctuation and the, uh, how often people are releasing. Right, so this is a, based on our survey that we did, along with the data that we collected, 26% uh, of, of the uh, survey folks uh, deploy uh, weekly, okay? And then monthly, then followed by multiple times a day. If you think about like Etsy, just to throw Etsy out there, no one works for Etsy here, right? Okay, good, awesome. I think this is being recorded, so bleep this out. Um, Etsy deploys, and they're not a customer, so, but this is just something I read in an article. Um, Full, full disclosure, they deploy, I, I believe, 50 deployments a day, and that's just Etsy. Imagine Netflix, imagine Facebook, imagine filling your favorite platform that's out there, all right? What role in your organization is responsible for containers and Kubernetes security? This is very interesting as well, because you would think you know, that you're gonna be talking to uh, you know, a security person or, or a person who's designated for security on that DevOps team, but this is actually all over the place, and actually, I would actually challenge this because lately, a lot of the conversations I have on LinkedIn, it, it, it just depends on the journey of the, cost of the organization, right? So where are you on that journey? Where are you in the testing? Where are you in your prototyping? If you're an organization like, I'm just gonna pick some old customers of mine, um, hopefully, hopefully you guys are not in the room, and if you are, raise your hand, I say hi. Um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, a, an organization that size is not gonna be the same as a mom and pop it, a company. If, if he and I are starting a, a company to compete against Facebook, then we're just getting started. The way we look at security is gonna be contextual based on where we are on that journey. You guys agree or disagree? Right, most folks, yeah? Most folks will forget to include security until it's too late, right? Now, one of the things we need to understand is who's involved in the security, even if you're a small team. Now, as the team grows up and you, get, you guys have a security operations center and you have a, a dedicated DevSecOps engineer, notice I didn't say team, just one person, because sometimes it's just one person. It's one person who's wearing the Yankee hat in the back, even though they're losing this year. I'm a Yankees fan, sorry. Your hat is calling my attention, so it's reminding me. Anyway, so why do we need security, right? Well. Again, think about this. If I use a little bit of analogy, if I just buy a new house or if I move into a new apartment, I need to secure it, right? I don't, I, I don't want to leave all my doors unlocked. I want to see what my blind spots are. Do I need to put an extra lock on the fence in the back? Do I need to put cameras on the corners, et cetera, et cetera? Yes, I, rough, I live in a rough neighborhood. I am also from the Bronx as well, hence the Yankee reference. So security for me contextually is going to be different from you guys right, who maybe live in a different area, you guys maybe grew up in a little safer neighborhood. So context is very important. So 
one of the reasons why we need security is quite often the reason why I yell at my 17-year-old son. Stop leaving the back gate open. Stop leaving the front door open. Please, when you go out to throw out the trash, bring the bins back in, et cetera, et cetera, right? Notice here at the bottom, the biggest in the last 12 months, security incidents, incidents have been reported, excuse me, are, are based on misconfigurations. So we as developers, I'm throwing myself in there because you know I try to I dabble with Golang now, but the first thing I'm gonna do is go pull up on Google, Google University, right, and say, hey, how do I do this? Shoot, ChatGPT, teach me how to do X, Y, and Z. I'm gonna take this code, copy and paste it, and I'm gonna throw it into my, my package. Or I'm gonna leave something out of my configuration when I'm configuring that package. So here's some uh, other reasons here. So you guys, again, you guys gotta get a copy of this. But the number one reason why we see security incidences evolving Kubernetes is detected misconfiguration. One thing I want to point out, uh, upper right-hand corner, our friends at Gartner, since we're you know, the federal space here, everybody knows who Gartner is. When I do this in smaller towns, I have to kind of remind people who Gartner is. But through 2025, more than 99% of cloud breaches will, will have a root cause based on misconfiguration and mistakes. Is that scaring you yet? Yeah, okay, great, awesome. Protecting Kubernetes. So two paradigms that we need to think about, posture management, and then runtime security, right? When you read any book on DevOps, you're gonna see the build, the uh, deploy, and the runtime uh, phases of, of DevOps, right? In Kubernetes, when Kubernetes is involved early and often, and when security is involved early and often, we wanna take care of the posture management early. What does that mean? We wanna look for known vulnerabilities, and we wanna look for known misconfigurations or custom misconfigurations. And then on the right-hand side of that paradigm, it, you know, again, this is where most people will depend on the security teams of their organizations to worry about runtime protection, right? Who has experience with uh, virtualization, that journey that we went through? I'm dating myself because I started off in the mainframe days. So mainframe, I went through virtualization. Remember those days, right? Security was big. Oh, we don't need to secure the hypervisor. We don't have to scan that. We don't have to do this. And I'm guilty of doing a denial of service attack at the Department of State because someone forgot to turn on security, right? So I've had those projects. So we always focus on runtime when something goes into production, but when it's in the development phase, we forget about security altogether, right? So what we wanna do is focus on shrinking the attack surface. Um, and we wanna do that often early on the CI CD pipeline portion of it. I think you guys get that. And then of course, once we get into runtime, we wanna make sure we're, we're focusing on uh, detecting and preventing real time events. All right, so let's talk about a little bit of Armo, a little bit of commercial, um, and a little bit of a story time. Uh, Armo started off actually working on runtime security in Israel. Um, and about a year and a half ago, when shopping this technology around in their version of Silicon Valley, um, the feedback that was being received by folks, the other startups and folks that, that they were going to, to uh, show them the, the, this new idea of Armo, the Armo platform, they, the feedback was we need more visibility, we need more compliance, and we need more governance in our clusters. We need runtime security, but we need more of that front end aspect of it. And just around the same time, this is gonna be interesting when I'm about to say this, I'm so used to saying this to non-government people, this is, this is awesome. Right around the same time, the NSA came out with a guide on how to harden your Kubernetes clusters. Has anybody read that document? That beautiful, eloquent, very entertaining, like I gotta read that on a Sunday document. Yeah, you? Okay, awesome. You don't play golf though, right, on a Sunday? Okay. All right, so this document came out. It was perfect timing for the Armo folks. And again, I wasn't there. I was you know, dealing with government folks for Palo. And they said, why, why don't we just create a, a project Project Cubescape, and let's figure out how do we do vi visibility compliance and governance on the front end. Basically burn the candle on this end while we're burning the candle on the back end. So while we're working on runtime security, and that's gonna be coming out uh, later on this year, in the beginning of next year, we came out with Project Cubescape, and we came out with the idea, not came up with the idea, sorry. We decided to give that project to the CNCF. And since then, skyrocketed. So if you guys haven't heard of Cubescape, please go and star it, but you can see here that it's one of the most popular uh, projects in the last year and a half. I would say half the people I talk to, that's, they go to GitHub and they come across this project and they say, tell me more about it. When I reach out to folks on LinkedIn, 
or you know, when folks get me on a meeting, that's, again, typically it's through op the open source side, okay? And Cubescape was, uh, so think of Cubescape as a policy engine, right? It's deployable on its own. It can be embedded into your CI CD pipeline. The Armo SaaS platform uh, allows you to run Cubescape within your cluster for continuous scanning. So you can either choose to run it as a CLI, as a standalone, or you can run it as a SaaS platform within each cluster. Now, what I love about this design, if anybody actually designs products from the des uh, ground up, it's built within each cluster. So you add more clusters, we grow with you. The SaaS platform is just a place to see the data. Okay, does that make sense? Questions, comments, concerns? You can, you can automate it, right? So if you wanna throw it into something that automates it, it is a one-time command. Like it's a one point in time scan versus what, what you get for the in cluster component piece. Um, did I answer your question? Yep. All right. Now what's good about the CLI is you can still dump the data up to the, our SaaS platform or you could dump it into Splunk or any other you know, data platform of your, cho of your choosing like Elastic or Splunk, I mentioned that, or both, right? You can choose to upload the data to uh, our platform as well. And I mentioned that we do have an offline version as well. Um, but again, we typically tell folks to test first on the SaaS platform, and then the offline version does require a little bit of scoping because of you know, ingress, egress, and other teams that we have to work with. All right, so what you get with uh, the single plane of glass with the SaaS platform is you get risk analysis and compliance. We have this really interesting feature called RBAC Visualizer. Um, it's interesting because it's not a tool per se, it's kind of like a, just a way to visualize your cluster from an RBAC point of view, right? Uh, we're gonna be adding more features there, but the idea there is that once you deploy a cluster or you just wanna kinda look and drag and drop what your cluster looks like from an RBAC point of view, you can actually pick and choose. My popular use case that I like using, my CEO likes to ask, always gets me on a call to talk about federal use cases sometimes with other customers, is you know, like the FBI, for example. FBI, when they take over an environment for investigation, think of like the Sony hack a few years ago, they come on scene, and you know, the CAT team shows up, the cyber action team shows up and puts the tents up. They typically dupe all that data and they eventually will forensically do it over and over and over and over again. So even though that hack has happened years ago, they're constantly looking at that data over and over again to learn, right? And think about like other organizations that put honeypots out there, right? So this is a good way of looking at how well your posture is it's kind of think of it like, a, like looking at your uh, security app for your, your house. Like, oh, I see all my security controls are on. I see all the angles. Oh, I forgot to turn off the lights. All right, cool, boom, I turned it off. So this visualizer allows you to kind of navigate your cluster from an RBAC point of view. Image scanning uh, as well. We do uh, image scanning at deployment. Uh, when you use our in-cluster uh, component. With the CLI, you can scan shift left, you know, like I mentioned in the CI CD, or you could do a point in time scan. But the image scanning, uh, actually this slide wasn't updated and I didn't get a chance to do that because I was stuck in traffic, um, is we just released a new feature using EPPF. Has everybody heard of uh, project EPPF? Yeah, show of hands. So for those who don't know, uh, it's an older project. It stands for the Extended Berkeley Packet Filter Project. And it's kind of had a resurgence recently because of some of the runtime security capabilities. So we're leveraging that underneath the covers with Cubescape now. And so with that, what we're doing is when you deploy your, your application to the cluster um, or you restart any of your containers for whatever reason, we'll, re we'll scan at that point of deployment what vulnerabilities are actually being loaded into memory. All right? So how many, who has a cluster? Raise it, somebody who has a cluster here? Anybody? All right. Uh, how, how large is your cluster? All right, all right. All right, cool, cool. So let's just use one cluster, 50 nodes, right? So to, I'm, I'm deploying an application to that cluster. If I deploy a vulnerability that runs in deployment and runs into memory, is that vulnerability, I'm gonna put you on the spot, is that vulnerability as important as a, vulner, uh, as a configuration or a package that's not configured and, and that's part of your stack? Maybe, it depends. Okay, the answer is yes. It does matter because what happens is your one, how big is your team? 12. 12, less than 10 people. So how often, better yet, better question, how long does it take for you to research a vulnerability? Less than a day? Wow, can I come work for you? Anybody else? What's the average, you think? 
I don't have that number up here, so this is like an impromptu number I just read recently. What's, what's the average? What do you think? Average for an analyst in the government. Let me put some parameters around this question, guys. What's the average in the government for a an security analyst to research a CVE for Kubernetes? A week? Wow. I need to get back in the government. It's actually an hour. It's an hour, an hour of time just to see if I should do something with that CVE, right? Now imagine if you ha how many vulnerabilities you have in your cluster. Exactly. Because that number is ugly, typically. Sorry to say that. All right, so here's a screenshot of what this looks like. And I apologize, we don't have time for a demo. If you guys are interested, I'll, I'll, we could talk offline. But, and this is not looking nice on this screen here, but on the left-hand side, you're gonna get a, uh, a list of your clusters by priority. Now remember, we're scanning for misconfigurations and vulnerabilities, right? So we, we get two numbers that are combined together. We get a risk profile for misconfigurations and a, and a risk profile for your vulnerabilities. And this is just basic dashboard stuff to kind of bring everything together. But the cool part here is that we'll let you know out of all your clusters which one you should be focused on, right? So that's the most important thing. Now on the command line, what we try to do is give you as much information as possible on the misconfigurations. Now, with the CNCF um, donation, there's a little bit of delay with the command line, so you're not gonna get the vulnerability information yet. That's in the roadmap. But with the vulnerability information, as I mentioned, when we bubble up that percentage of vulnerabilities that you need to focus on, that percentage is always, it's only in the SaaS version today. So it's coming in the CLI, but it's gonna be probably limited because you have open source versus premium features on the SaaS platform. One more thing just to point out. When you're looking at those vulnerabilities, right, let's just say the gentleman here has a thousand vulnerabilities, right, what we're really talking about is finding the sweet spot of what we should be focused on. If the gentleman here has sprints and there's an emergency deployment, for a security vulnerability. Am I gonna focus on the percentage of stuff that doesn't get configured, it doesn't get loaded into memory, or am I gonna focus on the stuff that gets loaded into memory? Now the advantage of that, of this technology that we just released, it just came out back in June, I believe, early June, is we're gonna be adding other attributes. So think about files, think about uh, file calls, think about network behavior, think about other aspects in the runtime that we can pick up on and then report back on to even give you a sweeter spot. Okay, good question. All right. The other thing we give you, that which most, most vulnerability scanners do give you, is they'll tell you if it's fixable. So we have that as well. And then we also give you uh, an, the, uh, the tag information of whether or not it's a remote controlled executable. So that's what we refer to as a sweet spot when you combine those three, all right? The, the vulnerabilities that get loaded into memory, the RCE, and the, um, and the, whether or not it's fixable. Because if, you know, great, it's getting loaded to memory, but I can't fix it until the vendor comes out with a fix. All right, so this is the, this is the sexy stuff, the data. All right, here, here is the data by region. You can see here that actually, this is actually surprising to me, actually, when I looked at another report recently uh, that confirmed this, uh, that most of Kubernetes deployments are actually in, the, in North America, in particular in the United States. And the reason why I say that is because most, you know, think about if you're, even if you're organized, if you're organized, if you're headquartered in the, in the United States, maybe you're picking various different cloud regions that maybe are supporting your use case. So I thought that was kind of surprising considering. Um, user title, again, the biggest person who's gonna deploy Kubernetes is someone who has DevOps in their title. And then followed by that, this, this is kind of the boring data to start off with. Number of clusters. 42% of organizations have at least one cluster. And you can see some of the sizes there, number of uh, nodes. Is that surprising to anybody as far as size? Who has any, what's the number, what's the largest cluster in this room? You said 50, right, per cluster. Anybody, anyone beat him? 90. 90? Do I have more than that? Sounds, sounds like an auction. <laughs> 90, anybody else? And how many clusters you said you had? 50 clusters. Where's the 90? How many clusters you have? Come on, that's easy. All right, now because of the NSA guide, remember I told you that story about how we took the NSA guide and that was our, our uh, basis for creating Cubescape. Since then we've added other frameworks. Um, so when you do scan your clusters, we're actually scanning your clusters based on these existing frameworks. Now we do give you the option to create a custom one. We actually embedded ChatGPT actually. So you can actually put your scenario in and say, hey, I wanna look for X and Y and Z and ChatGPT, with the governance that we, we wrapped around it, will just provide you the, uh, the Rego that you need for the control because we're, our engine is based on Rego. 
right? And we have our built-in practices as well. Um, and then we have what's called DevSecOps practices. So we just collect community-based best practices. Now, the right-hand score is different because one thing we just did recently is we switched our compliance number. A lot of people are having a hard time reading what 30 meant. So we now changed it to a percentage. So in that cluster example, if I have a cluster of 50 nodes, what percentage of resources in that cluster is compliant? So now when you log into the screen, you'll see a percentage like 80% of my resources meets compliance based on standard by MITRE. Okay. All right, 100% of cluster had misconfiguration items. No one was perfect. I love this one. 65% of clusters had at least one high severity misconfiguration. 50% of clusters had 14 or more failed controls. The biggest one is what, what we saw in our, in, our, in our data is the ability to stop running privileged containers. So you guys are all familiar with this. If you guys have messed with containers, this is kind of like, I, I get onto a container somehow, but I want to break out of it. I want to jump into another container. I want to jump into the runtime, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe, you know, maybe remote call to another operating system that's not even part of the cluster, right? So this is the biggest one that we found here. And again, just for time, I'm running out of time. Let's speed up a little bit. We have a whole blog article by our CTO who's, a, who's actually a Kubernetes pen tester, um, one of the founders of the company. He has a really good detailed article on this, on how to stop this, even if you're just not using this, to just how to configure a cluster. Um, 63 of clusters had workloads exposed outside of the cluster without proper ingress block. I think this is actually not a shocker because I think a lot of times in larger organizations, as I mentioned earlier, we depend on networking teams or the firewall team and other teams upstream to protect us. But again, we're only as good as the layers that we provide, right? And if you really think about it, if the jewels are the applications and the data that we're providing, shouldn't we have the security there as well, right? So food for thought. 63% of clusters had workloads without proper resource limitations. I'll send this out so don't, you don't have to memorize these numbers and scare your bosses for security budget. 37% uh, of clusters had applications with credentials and configuration files. Surprising, yeah? Are you doing that today? 23% of, cluster, of clusters have applications running with dangerous Linux capabilities. 35 of them, workloads running with insecure capabilities. And th those are some screenshots there which, that we want to point out. Uh, let's see, vulnerabilities by severity. So you can see here that 40% of those clusters had critical vulnerabilities deployed. Okay, now this, what this doesn't point out is what the, what the breakdown is between the different stages. You know, the various stages that that organization does, but even then, right, there's 44% across their estate. Uh, let's see, and then number of critical vulnerabilities. So 64% of the clusters had zero, which was pretty good. So, so you can see that there is a, uh, um, and of course, because we're fairly new, we don't have a historical data of this is improving or getting worse. But you can imagine as people are, are, are using Kubernetes more and more, and more folks are kind of joining the field, I think less and less are learning security. So I think this is kind of part of the, uh, the, the, the hype cycle that we have to sort of catch up with. These are the top five vulnerabilities that we found across all of the, the scans. And again, this is gonna be different from your environment, how you're building your apps, but these are just, data sets so you can understand that whether these are the more, most common ones um, that people are seeing. 63% uh, of the containers have one or more vulnerabilities. Da, da, da. You can see here 53% of containers have one or more RCEs. Everybody's familiar with RCEs, right? Remote control, executable. So that's the worst kind, right? Because again, if you think about the, the war on Russia versus Ukraine, if I can attack someone across borders, I have an advantage versus having to be on, prem, on premise to attack you, right? All right, we'll talk a little bit about that. It's kind of, okay, closing thoughts. All right, most companies are already running on Kubernetes clusters. Now, what's interesting is when I joined Armo seven months ago, eight months ago, I hope my CEO doesn't see this recording. It was interesting because the use case was, the, the common use case was like developers. We gotta call talk to every developer. I was like, well, what about the ops guys? You know, what about those folks? Those folks are being told to go set up the Kubernetes clusters and maybe they're not the developers. Maybe they're just the guy who also manages the virtualization stack as well. So in enterprises, uh, and then also, I remember the day that when I was at Citrix and the Netscaler first came out with a container version of that appliance, right? Th these are appliances that are kind of powering the internet today, but now you can deploy this appliance in a form of a container. 
And I remember that year, I'm like, ah, no one's gonna deploy the containers, virtualization is gonna stay here forever. And I look, I, I look stupid now, right? Because I should have learned containers back then. I probably would have been a lot smarter on Kubernetes today. But the, the reality is that when people call these vendors, now they're saying, hey, what are we, what's our runtime platform? What's our runtime strategy? It's not just about deploying an application to compete with the Netflixes, the Facebooks of the world, or the next, you know, whatever, your, the next machine learning application you're building. I may be deploying an actual office app on a, on a container, on a cluster instead. And that might just be an option. And then five years from now, that might be the only option if you really think about it. So that's one thing to think about. Security perspective seems like a big pain, right? The developer doesn't want to be told, or the team doesn't want to be told, we have to redo this thing because of security, because of some outside force, right? I'll give you a personal story. I worked for a startup out in San Jose. It was a VDI startup trying to compete with, with uh, Citrix. They're still around. Uh, and we were trying to go for FedRAMP. I think someone mentioned FedRAMP before, and I was hired to project manage the FedRAMP process. I don't know why I was thinking, but sure, I'll take the challenge, right? It was a startup. I thought it was going to be the next, you know, uh, Steve Jobs, right? And so I go over there and, and come to find out, we do the first audit. And come to find out, 20 developers got pulled into a room because they were using open source software, which is common, right? But for FedRAMP, there's certain controls that you have to meet. And it literally took 50% of that staff, I think 20, we had 20 at that time, it was about 10, 12 people just to, for a month and a half to rebuild that portion of that code that we, we had built. Opportunity, great for FedRAMP, right? Because we had a FedRAMP customer as a startup, but think about the lost time on the other features and the other sprints, that's half the team, right? So I, I bring that up as an example when I talk to management folks, right? Folks who are managing the time, managing efforts, managing the project plan. These are things to be aware of that security can slow you down. It's not just about being hacked. It could be just, hey, I have a compliance, I have to meet NIST standards because I work for the federal government. Well, are we taking care of that early or are we taking, that, taking care of that later in the phase? Um, new personas, I think I talked a little bit about that. I, I talk to folks sometimes, I'll talk to a DevOps engineer one day, hey, do you do security? Yes, I do everything security. I do 20% of my day is security. And the next day I'm talking to the same career path, same size organization, and they're not involved in security. And so there's new personas out there. So if security is a concern, which I think it should all be, hopefully I've scared you guys enough, uh, a little bit at least, to say, hey, I might not be focused on security, but who is my security person? So like that, I want to make sure I'm not contributing to the technical debt that's involved in, in our project. And then just kind of real quick, I'm getting the hook sign, uh, we are overwhelmed with vulnerabilities. We as humans, we cannot compete with machine learning. We cannot compete with automation. Forget about machine learning, scripting, right? These script kitties, they have tools, they go to the black market, they go to these black market websites, they get free tools. Shoot, I may even use something, if I was a, uh, a bad actor, you know, I may use something like Armel to see where your weaknesses are, right? And so pen testers love using products like this because it's an easy way to figure out what your blind spots are. Is it, 100, is it the, the silver bullet? No, you know, that's why we still need firewalls, we need security in depth. But if those things fail, right, how do you protect what's most important? The applications, the applications allow you to access data, right, and that's the crown jewel, right? That's why we, we build apps today. Two call to actions, because I am in tech sales, so I have to, two call, calls to action. A, follow, uh, follow me on LinkedIn, my, uh, I don't know if you guys caught the opening page. If you just Google search cloud dork with two Ds in the middle, uh, You'll find my LinkedIn page. Just hit me up. I, I, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of break for the summer, but I'm gonna start posting soon again about Kubernetes security and Armo. And the second thing is go to the website. If you have a test cluster, if you have access to AWS or some other uh, cloud environment, you wanna spin up a cluster for a few hours to test this, super easy to install, three minutes. Give me a call, I'll run you through it. Okay, 30 minutes tops. Thank you for your time. Thanks, man.